Hi everyone, uh, we're going to do part two of chapter five. Uh, if you remember, Mole had just smelled his old home and uh, was quite sort of uh, emotional and sad about this. And uh, Ratty wasn't really listening to him, was pushing on. With an effort, he caught up to the unsuspecting rat, who began chattering cheerfully about what they would do when they got back, and how jolly a fire of logs in the parlour would be, and what a supper he meant to eat, never noticing his companion's silence and distressful state of mind. At last, however, when they had gone some considerable way further, and were passing some tree stumps at the edge of a copse that bordered the road, he stopped and said kindly, "'Look here, mole old chap, you seem dead tired. No talk left in you.' and your feet dragging like lead. We'll sit down here for a minute and rest. The snow has held off so far, and the best part of our journey is over. The mole subsided forlornly on a tree stump and tried to control himself, for he felt it surely coming. The sob he had fought was so long, refused to be beaten. Up and up it forced its way to the air, and then another and another, and the others thick and fast, till poor mole at last gave up the struggle, and cried freely and helplessly and openly now that he knew it was all over and he'd lost what he could hardly be said to have found. The rat, astonished and dismayed at the violence of Mole's paroxysm of grief, did not dare to speak for a while. At last he said, very quietly and sympathetically, "'What is it, old fellow? Whatever can be the matter? Tell us your trouble and let me see what I can do.' Poor Mole found it difficult to get any words out between the upheavals of his chest that followed one upon another so quickly and held back speech and choked as it came. I know it's a shabby, dingy little place, he sobbed forth at last brokenly. Not like your cosy quarters, or Toad's beautiful hall, or Badger's great house. But it was my own little home, and I was fond of it. And I went away and forgot all about it, and then I smelt it suddenly. On the road, when I called you and you wouldn't listen, rat, and everything came back to me with a rush. And I wanted it. Oh, oh dear, oh dear, but you wouldn't turn back, ratty. And I had to leave it. Though I was smelling it all the time, I thought my heart would break. We might have just gone and had one look at it. Ratty, only one look. It was close by. But you wouldn't turn back, Ratty. You wouldn't turn back. Oh dear, oh dear. Recollection brought fresh waves of sorrow and sobs again took full charge of him, preventing further speech. The rat stared straight in front of him, saying nothing, only patting Mole gently on the shoulder. After a time he muttered gloomily, I see it all now. What a pig I've been. A pig, that's me. Just a pig, a plain pig. He waited till Mole's sobs became gradually less stormy and more rhythmical. He waited till at last sniffs were frequent and sobs only intermittent. Then he rose from his seat and, remark and remarking carelessly, Well now, we'd really better be getting on, old chap. Set off and up the road again, over the toilsome way they had come. Where have you g going, Ratty? cried the tearful Mole, looking up in alarm. We're going to find the home of yours, old fellow, replied the Rat pleasantly. So you'd better come along, for it will take some finding, and we shall want your nose. Oh, come back, Ratty, do, cried the Mole, getting up and hurrying after him. It's no good, I tell you. It's too late and too dark, and the place is too far off, and the snow's coming, and I never meant to let you know I was feeling that way about it. It was all an accident and a mistake, and think of the river bank and your supper. Hang the river bank, and supper too, said the rat heartily. I'll tell you, I'm going to find this place now, if I stay out all night, so cheer up, old chap, and take my arm, and we'll soon be back there again. Still snuffling, pleading and reluctant, Mole suffered himself to be dragged back along the road by his imperious companion, who by a flow of cheerful talk and anecdote endeavoured to beguile his spirits back, and make the weary way seem shorter. When at last it seemed to the rat that they must be nearing the part of roll, the road where Mole had been held up, he said, Now, no more talking. Business. Use your nose and give your mind to it. They moved on in silence for some little way, when suddenly the rat was conscious through his arm that was linked in Mole's of a faint sort of electric thrill that was passing down the animal's body. Instantly he disengaged himself, fell back a pace and waited, all attention, the signals were coming through. Mole stood a moment rigid while his uplifted nose, quivering slightly, felt the air. Then a short, quick run forward, a fault, a check, a try back, and then a slow, steady, confident advance. The rat, much excited, kept close at his heels as the Mole, with something of an air of a sleepwalker, 
crossed a dry ditch, scrambled through a hedge, and nosed his way over a field open and trackless, and bare in the faint starlight. Suddenly, without giving warning, he dived, but the rat was on the alert, and promptly followed him down a tunnel, to which his unnerving nose had faithfully led him. It was close and airless, and the earthy smell was strong, and it seemed a long time to Rat ere the passage ended, and he could stand erect and stretch and shake himself. The mole struck a match, and by its light the Rat saw they were standing in an open space, neatly swept and sanded underfoot, and directly facing them was Mole's little front door with Mole N painted in gothic lettering over the bell pull at the side. Mole reached down a lantern from a nail on the wall and lit it, and the rat, looking round him, saw they were in a sort of forecourt. A garden seat stood on one side of the door, and on the other a roller, for the mole, who was a tidy animal when at home, could not stand having his ground kicked up by other animals into little runs that ended in earth heaps. On the walls hung wire baskets with ferns in them, alternating with brackets carrying plaster statutory, Garibaldi, and the infant Samuel, and Queen Victoria's, and other heroes of the modern Italy. Down on one side of the forecourt ran a skittle alley, with benches along it, little wooden tables marked with rings that hinted at beer mugs. In the middle was a small round pond containing goldfish and surrounded by a cockle-shell border. Out of the centre of the pond rose a fanciful erection clothed in more cockle-shells and topped by a large silvered glass ball that reflected everything all wrong and had a very pleasing effect. Mole's face beamed at the sight of all these objects so near to it, so dear to him, and he hurried rat right through the door lit a lamp in the hall and took one glance around his old home. He saw the dust lying thick on everything, saw the cheerless, deserted look of a long-neglected house and its narrow, meagre dimensions, its worn, worn and shabby contents, and collapsed again on a hall chair, his nose to his paws. Oh, ratty, cried dismally. Why ever did I do it? Why did I bring you to this poor, cold little place on a night like this, when you might have been at the riverbank by this time, toasting your toes before a blazing fire? with all your nice things about you. The rat paid no heed to his doleful self-reproaches. He was running here and there, opening doors, inspecting rooms and cupboards, and lighting lamps and candles, and sticking them up everywhere. What a capital little house this is, he, ca he called out cheerily. So compact, so well planned, everything here and everything in his place. We'll make a jolly night of it. The first thing we want is a good fire. I'll see to that. I always know where to find things. So, this is the parlour. Splendid. Your own idea, these, those little sleeping bunks in the wall. Capital. Now I'll fetch the wood and the coals, and you get a duster. Mole, you'll find one in the drawer of the kitchen table. Try and smarten things up a bit. Bustle about, old chap. Encouraged by his inspiriting car companion, the mole roused himself and dusted and polished with energy and heartiness, while the rat, running to and fro with armfuls of fuel, soon had a cheerful blaze roaring up the chimney. He hailed the mole to come and warm himself, but the mole promptly had, lit, had another fit of the blues, dropping down on a couch in dark despair and burying his face in a duster. Rat, he moaned, how about your supper, you poor, cold, hungry, weary animal? I've nothing to give you, nothing, not a crumb. What a fellow you are for giving in, said the rat reproachfully. Why, only just now I saw a sardine opener on the kitchen dresser. Quite distinctly, and everyone knows that means there are sardines somewhere about in the neighbourhood. Rouse yourself, pull yourself together, and come with me and forage. They went and foraged accordingly, hunting through every cupboard and turning out every drawer. The result was not so depressing after all, though of course it might have been better. A tin of sardines, a box of Captain's biscuits needy full, and a German sausage encased in silver paper. There's a banquet for you, observed the rat as he arranged the table. I know some animals who would give their ears to be sitting down to a supper with us tonight. No bread, groaned M Mole. No butter, no. No pâté de foie gras, no champagne, continued the rat, grinning. That reminds, you, reminds me. What's that little door at the end of the passage? Your cellar, of course. Every luxury in this house. Just you wait a minute. He made for the cellar door and presently reappeared, somewhat dusty, with a bottle of beer in each paw, and another under each arm. Self-indulgent self beggar you seem to be, Mole, he observed. Deny yourself nothing. This is really the jolliest little place I was ever in. Now, wherever did you pick up those prints? Make the place look so home like they do. No wonder you're so fond of it, Mole. Tell us all about it, how you came to make it what it is. Right, we'll leave it there. 
and uh, we'll find out more about uh, Moll's home in the next part of chapter 5. Keep safe, keep happy and keep reading. Speak to you soon. Bye.